Welcome back to the podcast, Gabe Yannis and I. We are joined by Ryan Mickler today. Ryan, he started Order of Man. He has the Iron Council. He has a father of four, and today he drops a ton of information about what it means to be a man, about life, about lessons learned. I really enjoyed this episode, Gabe. You know, a lot of the guests that we have on the podcast are people that I know of, even like, you know, from the outside looking in, not as close as you, but like I always know them come with some preconceived notions, but Ryan Mickler, I was actually a hundred percent introduced to because you were like, Hey, we should have him as a guest on the podcast. And I am so glad that I went through his content, that we had him on the podcast, that now I know about his podcast and I can't wait to listen to more episodes. So anyway, long story short, Ryan's the man. I really enjoyed that episode. And I hope that you guys do too. Dude, Gabe becomes like a super fan. So what Gabe does is he'll find someone and he'll be like, you know, uh, Hormozy, and he'll consume everything of Hormozy. Then you know Chris, and then, and then you like he on. tries to learn, 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 learn. And now Ryan Mickler, he is the new guy that Gabe is going to dive into and learn everything possible from him. So no, I, I I appreciate that about you, Gabe. You're always trying to find more information, and that's what this podcast is about. You know, this podcast, whether it's the first time you've listened to it, whether it's the tenth or the hundredth time you've listened to the show, our goal is really to level ourselves up by learning from others. And as a byproduct, hopefully level up other people in the process. Because if it's helping us, hopefully it helps you as well. So simple ask, if you get value from this episode, leave us a rating, leave us a review. Definitely helps up the show. You know, we're not asking for anything else in return. We just appreciate it. If it helps you, chances are it can help someone else. So just share it with somebody. And uh, dude, without any further ado, Gabe, you ready to rock and roll? Let's get into it. Let's go. So Ryan, I want to know more about this man in the making podcast because I was fascinated by it. I just went and listened to pretty much all the episodes or a lot of the episodes. Yeah. And it's because it's a podcast with you and your son. And at the time, the the most recent episode that I saw was from a little over a year ago um, Mm -hmm. to to date. It was like, it was like about a year, year and a half ago. Yeah. What made you guys, I know like he was how old was he when you guys started the podcast and for how many years did you guys end up doing it? Because it seems super cool. What was the reason why maybe it didn't continue on? I want to dive into it because I thought it was awesome. I came across man in the making podcast and I absolutely yeah. loved it. Yeah. So that's my oldest son. And I did that project. Uh, I think when we started, he was maybe 13, 14, maybe when we started doing that, he'd always been really interested in what I was doing with order of man and uh, wanted to kind of follow in the footsteps. And we had some really, really cool conversations. You've heard a lot of them and we had fun. You know, I try to make it fun and enjoyable and do something different and not be always so serious about it because it was really, it was designed to speak to other young men. That's, that's what we wanted. It wasn't for other guys like myself or dads or anything. It was for the young men. So we had a lot of fathers who would listen with their sons on a weekly basis and we had a really good time doing it. You know, unfortunately, I'm, I'm an open book. I've been through some struggles over the past couple of years. Uh, I, I really dealt with some alcohol abuse issues. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that at all. Um, I went through a divorce. Uh, yeah, a, little, a little bit. I'd love to dive more into that. But yeah, we can a bit. for sure. Yeah. yeah, I'm an open book on it. I don't like talking about it necessarily, but it's important that I do because there's a lot of men who are dealing with the same issues. And so as I was going through some alcohol abuse struggles and ultimately the, the erosion of, of my marriage, um, there were some hard feelings on my, from my son. Mm -hmm. Uh, and he made the decision that he didn't want to do that anymore. I would have loved to continue. And looking back on it now as somebody who's sober and seeing things in a completely different light, a more positive, healthy light than I did maybe two years ago. uh, I I don't blame him. You know, I, I don't fault him for that. So, uh, he made that decision and I have to honor that decision. We have a, we still have a great relationship. Um, and in fact, it continues to grow, you know, as, as I've been sober and more attentive and interested in him and his siblings lives, he just turned 16 yesterday. So he's driving now. Oh. Like <laughs> that's tough. Cause you have this four. stuff is crazy. You have What's four, that? right? You have four. four. Yeah. 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 So I've got a, a 16 year old, a 13 year old, a 10 year old and a seven year old. So it's, Pretty wild. <laughs> man, man, 6, 16. It's funny because I was, you know, scrolling through a lot of your content and social media as we kind of prepared for this conversation. And one of the things, like one of the like tweets that you had posted on on Instagram that man really, really hit home. So I have a one and a half year old and one on mm. the way. So very young. Oh and awesome. 
Yeah. And it was um, the one where you said essentially that your youngest said that he he's too old now to hold hold your hand while walking. Yeah. And just yeah. reminding people to, you know, that time flies. <clears throat> and it was just like, I think I was literally going through your social media, like right before I went on a walk with my one and a half year old who just now he's just at the age where he's like walking outside and like holding your finger. So like just started. And it was just such a timely reminder because right now it feels like that time where he's not going to want to even hold my hand is so, so, so far away, but it's not right. Like this, this year and a half has flown by. And, um, anyway, I really appreciated that reminder. Cause it was, it came at a very appropriate time where I'm like right at the beginning of something that seems like it's going to last forever, but it's definitely not. Yeah. You want to know something even trippier than that is yeah. I made a post years and years ago. And I said something like one day you're going to put your child down and you're never going to pick them back up again. Oh, think about that for a second. Like you don't know when it is. You don't know when the last time is that you're going to put your child down, but you'll never pick them up again. So I'm excited for you. You're in a really good time. Just make sure live it up because it, it goes quick. But oh, man, if, if your kid sounds like you have a son, do you know if, if your next is a boy or a girl yet? Do you, it's a girl. Do you know? Girl. Awesome. Yeah. So you'll have one boy, one girl. Mm. Yeah. If when your children ask if you can play or watch a show or sit by them or hold your hand or whatever, even if you're having a bad day or a hard day or dealing with your own shit. Yeah. Do it a hundred percent. Do it. Like I've missed out on some of those moments and I've created a lot of friction and contention in my life uh, between, between myself and my kids. I'm, I'm working on repairing those relationships and sometimes I do really well and sometimes I don't, but yeah, don't, don't take those moments for granted. That's for sure. For sure, man. Well, I, I got to ask on, on that particular note, you know, I, I, I saw, and I was even talking to Gabe about this. This is a, I don't know, it's probably a couple months ago. You put something up on social media. I thought it was pretty relevant. I, 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 I appreciated it. You, you were talking straight to the camera and you were explaining how, um, you were getting some, for lack of a better term, like flack from, from people saying like, Hey, who are you to be talking about relationships and things like that? When you've gone through a divorce and you have this going on and you basically alluded to like, Hey, one of the reasons why I do think I could talk about this is because I have gone through these experiences. And like, for example, my wife and I have been together since we were 15 and I have a different vantage point than you do. And your vantage point is not better or worse. It's just different. And you've gone through now this divorce. You've had, you've gone through this, this struggle. And I think you can make a, um, incredible impact on other people by sharing your experience and what you've learned, but that's just different than my experience and what I've learned. Right. And so I, I wanted to ask you like on, on that note and what you were sharing, you were basically saying that like, what makes you credible? First off, no one needs to listen to you if they don't want to, right. It's up to them. They're, right. they're grown adults, but the reason why you feel compelled to share is because you want to help other people based on what you learn. And so I'm curious if we could dive a little bit more into that because of that background lessons learned and, and, and you know, what you're having to do to repair, but like, what could you have done differently to not even have to repair in the first place and what others listening dads in particular can take away from that? Yeah. I mean, I, I here's the, here's the thing. There's one factor that I think makes the difference between, you know, telling somebody what they should be doing and you're not doing it yourself or being credible in what you're sharing. And that's just being honest. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. You know, if I, if I came to my audience and I said, Hey guys, look, I'm a relationship expert and here's the top 10 things you should do to build a marriage that's going to last until your death. That would be a lie. I haven't done that. I, I can't, I can't say I've, I've done that. Now, look, People will say, oh, well, you know, you had to demise your marriage. I've been married for seven years, so I know more than you. Bro, I was married mm -hmm. for 18 years. When you get to 18, let me know and we'll talk. Because we had our share of fights and challenges and struggles in 18 years. We were together for 20 years. Um, and it's not a pissing contest either. So the way that I look at it is I'm just going to be honest. Now, there were some things that objectively I did really well. And there were some things that objectively I did really poorly. And if I'm honest about that and, and, I, and I don't present myself as something other than I am, which is a flawed human being, somebody who wanted to have a lifelong marriage who didn't because of, of my own choices, you know, then, then I, there's no issue with that. So if I say, hey, guys, look, you know, here's some things that worked well in my marriage. It's one, two, and three. And here's some things that I did pretty poorly that given the chance, 
I, I will do different. And I'm in another relationship now and I am doing a lot of those things different. And you know what? The relationship is better than it was because I'm doing those things different. But again, the, the whole concept is dropping the ego, dropping the pride, dropping the, the persona, the facade, and just being really honest about the things you did well and the things you didn't do well and let the chips fall where they may. So that's what I'm trying to do. Man, I, I'd love to hear more about, and, and I appreciate you being open about sharing these things because, you know, I think that a lot of people out there on social media, on podcasts, like it's very easy to share the positives, but you know, like you said, I don't think you necessarily love talking about this stuff all the time, but you feel like it's beneficial. And so you want to, I'd love to dive a little bit more into, like you said, like, what are those things that you felt you did really well? And what are those things that you think, you know, that you're now that you learn from and you're trying to improve on now? Yeah. Well, a couple of things. I mean, the obvious one is stop drinking, right? If, if you guys are drinking and uh, letting these sorts of things, and it, and it could be a lot of different things. It could be drinking, it could be drugs, it could be distracting yourself or sedating yourself with other methods. Something as simple as video games, for example, or pornography is another one you see a lot of gambling. There's a lot of things that we could potentially participate in that drives a wedge between you and your wife. And for me, it was, it was alcohol. Mm. And I, I started drinking just to shut things down. I'm a hard charger, high achiever. Both of you guys are as well. My mind doesn't stop. It's always going. And so I'd have a drink maybe once, twice a week, have a drink at night. That's it. And it was a little, a little bit of a reprieve where my mind would just shut down. I wouldn't have to think about everything else and the wheels would stop turning. And then one drink per week turned into one drink a night. And then one drink a night turned into three drinks a night. And then three drinks a night turned into a little bit of day drinking occasionally. And then that turned into every day. And then towards the end of, of this cycle, I would, I would wake up in the morning and I would go get alcohol, whiskey, fireball was my, my drink of choice. I'd go get fireball and I would sit in my driveway at six, 7 a.m. in the morning and drink a half pint of whiskey. And then I would go inside and start my day. And at the end there, it was 24 hours of being either drunk, passed out, or hungover. And uh, man, we got to find a way to put that stuff down. We can't sedate ourselves from, from the life. And if you ever feel like you need to escape from your reality, then I think that's a pretty good reminder to you that something's off. If I feel like I have to shut down or escape from my current reality, then I probably ought to do a little soul searching into why that's the case. And so to answer your question, Gabe, as I was drinking, I mean, obviously emotions are going to take over. You're not thinking rationally. You're not thinking level-headed. You lose patience. I was angry, bitter, contentious, hostile. There was never any physical abuse, but I'd be lying if I, if I said that I wasn't uh, emotionally and, and verbally abusive at times through this. And I hate to say that. I hate to admit that, but that's the reality. And I won't even tell you that's the alcohol talking it was me. I said those things and I did those things and I made poor choices. And so I'm trying to make better choices. Uh, but that that's the biggest thing for me is, man, put the sedation methods away and ask yourself if you're trying to escape or hide from your life, why is that the case and what can you do? Uh, the other thing that really stood out to me is I've kind of thought about the demise of my relationship is, man, I tried, I, I did a lot of controlling and manipulation in order to get what I wanted. It was like an element of control. I needed to have control. I felt more safe if I had that. And I've learned to let a lot of things go. Things that normally would bother me, things that people say, maybe even things that she's doing that I don't agree with. I need to let people make their own decisions. And that includes a significant other. Let people make their own decisions. Um, don't be such a, such a hero. Don't rush in to, to, to solve her problems. Just be there and be supportive. You know, like if she comes home and she's like, ah, I had a shitty day. It's like, Oh, I'm sorry, hon. Want to talk about it? That's it. Just being there and listening and being available for her. Not like, Oh, well, yeah, you had a hard day. Your boss is being a jerk. So you need to do X, Y, and Z. I don't do that anymore because those aren't my decisions to make, but I can be supportive and I can empathize with you. Uh, and I can care about you and I can hope that you change your situation, but ultimately that's on you, not on me. So those are a couple of lessons I learned. Man, the the second thing, I it, it's so interesting like hearing you say that because our the 
I think it's the last guest or second to last guest, <clears throat> excuse me, that we had on Thomas DeLauer mentioned almost exactly the same thing as something he learned mm. by having a daughter. So it was interesting because oh, the yeah, thing that yeah, him, yeah. that made him aware that, you know, sometimes your significant other, your, your wife specifically, you know, this tends to be something that, that, you know, not every time, but generally applies to women. Like they just want to be heard, right? Like they, they don't necessarily want you to tell them how to fix the thing. They just want you to like hear them that they have this thing that is making them feel a certain way. And he had the example of like now having a daughter, he like saw the fact that sometimes that's all they need and it made him aware of that. So it was interesting. You know, we, we have these guests on the podcast that are always like, you know, men, dads, husbands that we, you know, look up to and want to learn stuff from. So when you see those commonalities between two guests, it's, it's, it's super interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean the, the strongest two words that I have learned recently for exactly what we're talking about, it's this phrase right here. I want men to internalize this phrase. That sucks. Like that's you mean it. Just, re, just just sharing that back. Like, hey, that's uh, like you're not trying to yeah. fix anything. You're just you're just trying no. to be compassionate. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, if your wife's like, hey, I had a bad day at work, or I had, you know, the kids were being little jerks today, and it was a hard day, or I'm tired, or my my mom and I got into a thing. That sucks. Want to want to talk about it? Yeah. And then when yeah. she's like, yeah, I do want to talk. And she starts telling you about it. Say, oh man, yeah, I'd feel the same way. That's hard. That's rough. You doing okay? Yeah. Just keep saying different versions of that. And I'm not saying to game it. We're not trying to game. We're not trying to manipulate. It's just a tool. It's just a little bit of a strategy. Don't solve the problem. Don't say, well, yeah, the reason you, you and your mom got into it is because your mom's a bitch. <laughs> you're going to, you're stepping into, you're stepping on a landmine. Don't do uh. that. Yeah, 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 just, yeah, yeah. She already knows that. She knows her mom's a bitch. <laughs> so just say, that sucks. Do you want to talk about it? Tell me more about that. Oh, man, I'd feel the same way. Why do you feel like that? That's it. It's so powerful. And it actually shows that you care. And I think the important part, too, though, is to, like, not just pay lip service to that, but to, like, actually yes. want to listen and care, not just like, all right, you know, let me go through this for, like, a little bit, and then I'll go back to whatever I'm doing, um, which I think is the toughest part, right? Because, because uh, I listen, like, I'll, I'll admit to this, like, I definitely, like, that urge to hear, okay, the issue is X, and then I'm immediately thinking in my mind, well, I mean, the solution would be this, and you, like, you, you want to share that. Because it's like, it feels like you're, you're helping. It feels like, well, the reason we could have not gotten to this situation is if we would have done this and you want to like <laughs> tell them, you know, fix the problem. So it's interesting to, you know, the work you have to do to kind of really embrace what it is you're sharing. To me, it's like, if, uh, it's like a man asking a, a woman about pregnancy. Like you never, ever bring up a woman being pregnant, unless she explicitly says, I am pregnant. You Outside mean of that, you don't, little, you see, you mean if you see like a little bump, not to be like, Hey, are you pregnant? Is there, are exactly. You <laughs> yeah, bro. I did that one time. I was in oh. old Navy. I remember it. I did it one time and she looked pregnant. Oh, and, good old old and I said, I said, she was the lady who checked us out. I said, when are you due? And as soon as I said it, I was like, Oh boy. I'm in for it. I, what, why? Like, I know not to do this. And fortunately she was like, oh, I'm doing, you know, three months or whatever. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's great. Congratulations. You know? And I was like, breathe the sigh of relief. as she said, I am pregnant. But the point I'm making is unless she explicitly tells you she's pregnant, you don't need to broach that subject. It's just a no, no. And unless your wife is specifically asking you, Hey, what do you think I should do? Then it's, that sucks. Tell me more. Oh, I'm sorry. That must have been hard. Yeah, that is difficult. I'd feel the same way. No solutions unless she explicitly says, what do you think I should do? And then you yeah. offer it once and you go back to the default of, hey, that sucks. I'm sorry. Unless she asks you again. And and these these like you know your background and what you're going through. I I do have to ask just to kind of backtrack just for a quick second, and we can move. I want to talk about order of man and a bunch of other stuff. But when it came to the alcohol, what was like the turning point in that particular case? Like, uh, I, I guess it's two questions. Like, what what do you think you could have done? What is the, what was the early signs you were seeing? You, you said something like, hey, if you're finding yourself having to dive into these things, right, you got to check yourself and be like, why am I doing these things, right? But it seems like it just escalated over time. 
And so I'm wondering what you could have done as a check-in, like as it escalated to, 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 you know, counterbalance that. And then what was like the, the final straw that really made you, I mean, I, I imagine it was part of the divorce and whatnot, but what could you have done during that process? Cause it seems like that escalated over time is I guess my question. Yeah. I think there's something called what I would call the drift and it's very easy to drift off course. I think about this um, uh, ship that collided into the yeah. bridge in Baltimore. That Dude, that ship from rough, that right? Was crazy, yeah, crazy. But I watched the video, and as far as I can see, it looks like. I mean, I don't know the details, but it looks like it lost power, and then you can see it drifted, right? So it started to drift into this beam that's supporting this bridge, and then power, I think, came back on, and immediately when power came back on, it course corrected because that's I'm sure how the the props were lined up. I don't I don't know all the inner workings or engineering of that stuff, but that's what it looked like. And then once it was aligned and because it overcorrected, the power went off again and then it just drifted into, into the support beam and the, the bridge collapsed and killed people. That's what happens with our life. There's drift that happens. And unless we're deliberate and intentional about keeping the power on, and that power is daily planning. It's reading, it's checking in with, friends. It's having healthy outlets. One of the things that exacerbated the problem for me is I got injured in jujitsu. I was training with one of my training partners. His name's Brian Littlefield. He's, he's a black belt. You know, you know, Brian, Jason, right? I do know. Yeah. 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 I know that with for origin. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so him and I were training and he was, I mean, he's very, he's a black belt. He's very, very talented. He's an incredible player. And he was in side control and I had, had my arm trapped that he was on the side of. And I was pushing on him and pushing on him, pushing on him, hoping that he would lean back into me and I was going to try to sweep him. Well, I mean, he's privy to what I'm doing. Clearly he's been doing this for long enough that he just didn't push back. He just stayed where he needed to stayed at home and he was safe. Uh, and I kind of chuckled. I'm like, you're supposed to push back on me. And he's like, yeah, I'm not doing that. You know? And we both laughed. And instead of doing it technically, I just tried to muscle it. And so I, I had my arm extended and I just tried to go like this and sweep him. And I felt it pop right here. And the he pack. felt it pop. He's yeah. I thought it was my bicep uh -huh. at first. And he was like, Whoa. And I stopped and he stopped. And immediately it was like my bicep right under here was all disfigured and deformed. Long story short, I ended up completely rupturing my pectoral muscle from the bone itself. And I had to have surgery and I didn't have that outlet. And so the drinking actually picked up because I didn't have that healthy outlet of being around other men, of having that physical training, of having, I, I have a, a little bit of a combative spirit and not having a healthy outlet for that in the form of jujitsu was really, really difficult on me. Uh, and, and that's where the drinking really picked up. And I, I'm not blaming it on that. Those are still my choices, but these are things that led to the decisions that I was making. So to answer your question, I could have had, I could have done a better job of having men in my corner. I could have found other mediums for physical release since I couldn't do jujitsu. Uh, and, and, you know, just being a little bit more aware of yeah. what I was experiencing, feeling and what I had lost and, and the toll that it would take. The, the term you used combative, what was the term combative, um, like and what I say, combative spirit. Is that what I said? Combative say? spirit. I, I totally relate to that, by the way. Like I, I can completely connect with that term. Like, because whether it was Muay Thai or in jujitsu, like I, I feel like that combative spirit is there and you go to jujitsu and you just feel like that, that spirit has just been like deflated. You leave there just feeling like a lot different calm than you get from like a traditional workout. And so I can relate to that. And anyways, Gabe, you, you were going to say something, huh? Well, I'm just glad, like, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up, Ryan, because vices don't come out of the blue. Like at, at the end of the day, it's people's decisions, right? But sure. there has to almost be something missing for those to have to replace it. And, you know, for us, you know, we talk about exercise, physical activity all the time. And I think that, you know, Jason talks about from a young age, his son, Caden, <clears throat> you know, he's told me many times that he's got to run him. Otherwise he starts acting up like, you know, he's got to, he's got to get him to like burn some energy, burn do out some stuff outside. Yeah. yeah. And I think that like, that's something that is very real for all of us, all of our lives. Right. And I think that once we start 
losing those outlets because we're sitting down all day at work and we're sitting in the car and then we're coming back and we're sitting down and watching TV. Like that's where we need something to like replace that. And I think that that's where at least we, we, we open the door to some of these vices. And, um, so I can see how that story, you know, is something that I'm sure people can relate to and the way to get in front of it is to make sure that you find the healthy outlets for that stuff. And, and even when injury or circumstances make possibly one outlet a little bit less convenient or you can't do it, you have to find something else. You have to. Yeah. Yeah. It's a requirement in my life. And there's a lot of days I'm not as disciplined. Um, I'm not even as, as motivated as I know, like Jason, for you, for example, I'm not as motivated as you are when it comes to physical training. I'm, I'm just not, but I also know how important it is. And I have to force myself. Yesterday was one of those examples. I got up at 6 a.m. I think it was actually a little earlier, 5.30 maybe. And um, I got up before my alarm, which I don't normally do, but I did. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to go to the gym. I'm like, nah, you deserve, you deserve a break. Like, nah, you don't need to go in. You're okay. Mm -hmm. you, you didn't sleep very well. You got a busy day today. And, but I went in because I've not because I wanted to, but because I know it's something I needed and I forced myself to be there. And I decided that instead of going and just showing up and going through the motions, I was going to go twice as hard as I normally did. And, and that's what I did. And I walked away feeling good and rejuvenated. This has been a reoccurring theme in my life since the time I was little. Uh, I, I grew up with some father figures in and out of my life. And my mom primarily raised us on her own. And it was interesting because she could tell when I was becoming restless. And those moments were in, in, in moments where I wasn't, where I wasn't engaged in the sport. I played football for four years. I played baseball for four years. I was cut my sophomore year from the basketball team, which was a good decision on the coach's part. Uh, but I didn't do anything that year. And I got really restless. I started to get into fights and I started mm -hmm. to uh, create problems at school and my grades slipped a little bit. And the next year, my football coach said to me, hey, you need to wrestle during this winter season. And if you don't, then you don't get to play football for me next year. And football was my sport. So I'm so glad that he said that. I, I resisted that. And I went and wrestled that year, enjoyed it, loved it. It was kind of my first entry into combative sports and, and martial arts. And uh, I noticed that the grades were where they needed to be. And I didn't have that restless spirit, that combative spirit, because I had a healthy outlet for channeling it in proper environments. Yeah. Dude, I, I connect with that too, man. I, I mean, I see it with my son, not so much with my daughter, it's a little bit different for sure. But with my son, like he has to be engaged in sports on a regular basis. Otherwise he starts to act out and he doesn't even realize it, right? He just, it just like, he doesn't even realize why he acts the way he does. He just has this, uh, you know, intention, like he has this um, intensity. And when you're sitting at school all day, it just comes out in a bunch of different ways. But all of a sudden, if you have sports and um, you're dedicated to the team and you're training, um, I've seen huge improvements in him. So uh, he's the exact same way as you and same way as me. But I, I want to ask about the the working out. You know, Gabe and I talk about this all the time that like for some of us, you only have so much discipline in your like discipline bucket. And for me, like the cold plunge, that kind of stuff, it's really hard for me to do. I did it this morning. Gabe and I talk crap back and forth because he keeps his at like 40 degrees. I keep mine at a cool 55. But nonetheless, <laughs> <laughs> I still got in it this morning. And that's really hard for me. Um, whereas training is really easy for me. You know, going on the mats, going to the gym, it's not hard for me. It's something I really look forward to every single day. And so I'm wondering for you, like there's probably a bunch of things that you do that are really easy for you, but are harder for me as an example. And so on a regular basis, when it comes to your training, what do you find helps you stay more consistent? Because do you train on your own or do you try and create a group around you to train with? And then what is the balance there between training with others and training on your own? Well, so when you're talking about training, there's, there's strength training, which is something I'm very involved with. And then there's jujitsu. Those are the two I'm primarily involved with when it comes to the type of training you're talking about. Yeah. I've got this incredible gym. Sornex set me up with a gym here in my garage and it's beautiful and it's got all the things and I never use it. Really? Because I never use it. I mean, occasionally I might go out there at night and crank out, you know, a bench press or do some pull-ups with the kids or something like that. But it just, it doesn't work for me having a home gym. 
I, I just won't do it. So I have a membership to a 24 hour center here in my town and I get up every day and I go there. I don't even really, t- I don't talk to anybody while I'm there. I always have one earbud in cause I want to be able to hear, but also have one earbud in to listen to some music. Um, people laugh. I usually either listen to podcasts or even just country music. A lot of guys are like, yeah. oh, you need something harder or heavier. I'm like, I don't. This works. Dude, for I listen me. to country music all the time, man. That's what I. Oh, that's what okay, I work yeah. out to. Yeah, it's so weird, yeah. right? Like, yeah, yeah. So I do that. Um, I, like I said, I don't really talk to anybody unless I see a friend. I might say, "Hey, how's it going?" And we'll talk for thirty seconds, and then I get right back to my work. So it's not so much the one-to-one interaction, but it's the energy that I get from mm-hmm. being there, and it's the deliberate, intentional step of driving to the gym. Plus, it has a lot of different equipment that I like because I like variability in my training schedule. It would be, I would get bored if I didn't have some sort of variability in it. And whenever I post anything about training jujitsu or, or strength training, people will say, oh, well, you know, you need to do boxing or Muay Thai and, oh, strength training isn't good. You need to do Olympic lifting or Olympic lifting is not good. You need to do bodybuilding. It's like you could get inundated. It doesn't matter. And then all the, all the guys who don't strength train will tell me, oh, well, you need more cardio. You need to go run. None of it matters for the average person. None of it matters. What matters for the average guy is the thing that's going to engage you for the longest period of time possible. 100%. So if if running's your thing, it's not mine. I'm not going to be a huge advocate for going to run either sprints or long distances. But if that engages you, go do that. If you don't like jujitsu, and my son, my oldest son, it's a little blasphemous. It hurts my heart a little bit. He doesn't like jujitsu. Oh, I know. I, so I know, I know, I know he's almost perfect, but he's not, <laughs> uh, he doesn't like it. So if I force him to go train jujitsu, how's that going to work between not only our relationship, but his ability to develop physical strength and, and health, but he likes, he, he's a power lifter. Right. He's competed in powerlifting competitions. He's gone to national powerlifting high school competitions. Um, he's big into lacrosse right now. So fine. If powerlifting and lacrosse are your thing, then that's my thing too. I will support you in that. I will be involved in that. I will help facilitate that. I will buy the equipment. I will invest in trainers, whatever you need. But the key is finding something that speaks to you. So when you hear all these quote unquote men podcasts talking about jujitsu, I find value in that. I talk about that a lot. I know you do as well, but if it's not your thing, I don't care. Go do something else. Maybe it's boxing. Maybe it's Muay Thai. Maybe it has nothing to do with combat sports whatsoever. And it's Frisbee golf. I don't know. Dude. Fine. Immerse yourself in that. That is fine with me. Whatever's going to keep you engaged the longest, then that's what you should do. Gabe's sitting over there all fired up because oh, because it's, it's so true, man. Yeah. Dude, because <laughs> we talk about this all the time. And also I think that like the other thing is that it's perfectly okay to have seasons of your life where you're into very different things. And like yeah, that's what sure. keeps it fresh. That what keeps you like, you know, right now I'm super into like, you know, bodybuilding type training and aesthetics. I've been a runner, I've been a triathlete. Jason is a hundred percent gonna convince me to do Brazilian jiu-jitsu at some point. So like these are all seasons that I get super immersed in what I'm doing and I go all in, but then it gets to a point where I was like, that served its purpose. That was fun. But the one thing that's not negotiable is moving, training, doing hard stuff, learning new skills, being consistent. Um, and I actually really enjoy the fact that I, I think I've gone through like, you know, these two, three year seasons where I go all in on something and then it just kind of like, you know, I move on, I go do something else. Hey, Ryan, there's um, this, uh, Jason, can uh, I say one thing about yeah, that? Go, yeah, yeah. I got a question for you. But yeah, go ahead. There's this, uh, there's this really interesting phenomenon and it's perpetuated by guys like us, uh, the David Goggins types of the world. And I love Goggins. I don't want to be like Goggins. I don't want to live his life, but I love, we need people like that. But in this space, there is this constant force feeding of go hard, go all in, go hundred percent grind. There's not, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But the thing that I've really been experimenting with, implementing a little bit more in my life is just playing, is just having some fun. You know, Gabe, you're talking about, hey, I'm going to bodybuild for the next couple of years and you're playing, you're having fun, you're enjoying it, you're experimenting. There's something to be said for that. 
when I go to jujitsu with this like objective, I'm going to learn this thing and I'm going to submit these many people and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to get submitted. It's not as good as if I go and I say, Hey, I'm going to experiment tonight. I'm going to play. I'm going to try new things that are risky. I'm going to tap early. I'm going to get back into it and reset. And I'm just going to enjoy myself. I'm 42 years old. I turned 43 here in a couple of weeks. I don't know. Maybe it's a little bit of maturity where I don't feel like as much I have anything to prove as much as I want to enjoy life and I want to try new things and I want to enjoy the things I'm doing, not necessarily grind and make myself miserable through everything I'm doing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, like I, I, the way I like, I, I get my, my kicks through misery. Right. So like, I love just getting at it like crazy. But to your point, like tomorrow morning, we're doing a men's club meetup. And literally the text message I sent to the group was we're going to move heavy objects from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill. That's, that's the workout. And it's just something different. Like I'm going to go load up a bunch of sandbags at the bottom of this hill and we're going to take them to the top. I don't know how many guys are going to show up. I don't know how much weight we're going to have. We're going to move heavy shit from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill. But that's an example of what you're talking about. Like, it's just kind of like, I mean, that's an extreme example, but it's like play. It's just like, Hey, look, we're going to do hard shit as a bunch of guys. And it's not going to be so scripted or whatever. It's just like, we're just, I'm just going to dump sandbags. We're going to figure it out. I don't even know what we're going to yeah. do. <laughs> yeah. Um, I love it. It makes it exciting. Hey, hey, what role does negotiation play with kids? So this is something I've been thinking about lately. And I'm curious your thoughts on this. So I never thought we'd going to get my son a, a PlayStation 5. And so it, we held out for a long time. My son turns uh, 10 in a week. And uh, we got him a PlayStation 5 for his birthday because I wanted him to be able to play Madden and other games with his friends because after they're done playing outside, no one would ever come over to our house because we didn't have a PlayStation or anything. So like when they were done playing outside, they like, I don't know, they didn't know what to do with themselves. They couldn't, whatever. So I'm like, all right, well, you guys stay outside. And then when it gets dark, if when you guys come in, you can play Madden with each other. It's a way to connect. And anyways, I got convinced. Long story short, um, we're negotiating right now. And I'm saying, hey, jujitsu is like a primary skill in life that I need you to do. And so he came to me. He's like, all right, dad, here, here's the deal. We're going to negotiate. I'm going to take out the trash. I'm going to stretch every day. I'm going to sit on the floor. Instead of sitting on the couch, I'm going to sit on the floor. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do jujitsu with you once a week, minimum. In return, I get the online access or whatever for the PS5 so I can play against people, uh, you know, uh, my friends. I'm like, okay, well, whatever. So anyways, I told him, I was like, all right, over the next month, if you do X, Y, Z, your mom and I will think about doing this. So we started negotiating. So what I'm curious about is like, what's important to me may not be important to him, like jujitsu and as a, as a self-defense and all the different things. And maybe what's important to him, like being able to play online, like it's not important to me, but it becomes important because it's important to him. So I'm curious, like what role do you think that negotiation kind of like that tit for tat kind of plays in? Because that's kind of where I'm at with him right now. And it seems to be maybe working. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, but isn't that life? Isn't life yeah, just yeah, a series of negotiations? Yeah. You know, so I think you're teaching him a skill because he's going to have to make decisions. You want something, you've got to sacrifice for it. And the sacrifice in this case is stretching jujitsu once a week, whatever else you guys have set up. And then he gets the reward. That's life. We live in a meritocracy for the most part. Uh, so I think you're teaching skills that help him understand that if I want this thing, then I have to do these other things. And I think the correlation between that is a really healthy way to go. Um, I'm, I've been critical of video games in the past. I'm not as critical as I used to be, but as a parent, it's our job to make sure that the things our children want to do are done in healthy parameters. You know, my, my second son loves video games, but mm -hmm. we have healthy parameters and boundaries set up so that he can enjoy what he enjoys and he can have fun with friends and connect with them. But there's parameters. If I hear him swearing, for example, as he's talking to his friends, or if he's doing it too long, then he knows like we can operate within these boundaries and these are healthy. So I'm all for negotiation. The other thing I like about negotiation is you're letting a child, your 10 year old in this case, have some independence. Isn't that what we want? I've seen way too many parents control absolutely everything about their mm -hmm. children's lives. And they expect at 18 that they're going to go out on their own and they're going to be successful. Well, you just, you, you, you hobbled your children because you never gave them any length of rope to, slightly hang themselves with, <laughs> you know what I mean? We don't want them to kill themselves, but we right. want them to experience the consequences, both positive and negative of the decisions they're making in controlled and healthy environments. So if, if your son, it sounds like this was his idea, 
is saying, hey, dad, what do you think about this? That's healthy. He's testing the boundaries. He's trying to create some sort of significance or meaning in his own life. All of that is super healthy. And I think you're doing a great job based on what I'm hearing you say, facilitating independence and other lessons that that come with it. So I'm all for it. You know, selfishly, I just have to say this right now. Like I am so lucky that I co-host this podcast and get to listen to Jason and everyone else that comes on. Cause I feel like I'm, well, not like I feel I'm literally like seven years behind where Jason is and when you guys are. And whenever I hear you guys talk about this stuff, like I'm just like mentally taking notes, thinking about it. And I, I really hope we have some young dads or, or prospective dads listening to the show. Cause I mean, just the value that I've gotten by being a part of these conversations has been incredible so anyway just i i appreciate you guys sharing and just Dude, wanted well, to point that out one point i wanted to make on this subject because well by the way i appreciate your insight right it makes me feel better about where i'm at because i i hadn't looked at it through the it, but oh maybe a year ago my son comes to me he's like hey look i want to i want to make a couple of bucks i'm like all right i, I can appreciate that <laughs> i was like i was like well we pay a, a land like a, a gardener landscape guy right and sure. he's like well let's let's take it over you and me i'm like all right, let's do it. So I went out, I bought all the different supplies so we could take care of our own yard. And I let go of the gardener. And, you know, after like a couple of weeks kind of fizzled out and I'm like, I'm like, so I learned my lesson that time where I, um, I kind of gave in without proving the model first. And so now with this time around, I'm like, no, you don't get what you want until you show me for a month that you could do it. And then we'll have the conversation about doing it. Because I think before I jumped the gun. I should have made him like earn that a little bit longer and then triggered it. So um, that was one lesson that I've learned, um, at least in the art of negotiation with the 10 year old is, you know, they have to prove it to you first. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and, you know, 10 year olds, obviously they're going to lose interest or they have a, sure. a unrealistic expectation of what doing the yard might actually be. You know, they look at it and think, oh, this is easy. And then I can make 30 bucks or whatever. Yeah, well, you you can, but there's work that goes on behind it and they don't see it the same way somebody our age might see it. So there might even be opportunities to um, have them dabble in it where it's like, okay, well, let's let's do this once a week. Yeah. Every Saturday morning, you get up, you mow the lawn and show me you can do that and you're going to earn five bucks or whatever, you know, whatever your arrangement is. And then you do that for a month and we'll talk a little bit more about, do you want to do more or do you just want to keep mowing the lawn? And you'd gradually yeah. build him into, and maybe, maybe he decides he wants to do more and maybe he decides he doesn't, but we also have to make sure that they understand the consequences of poor decisions as well. So in this case, if he mows the lawn for four weeks, a lot of parents will do this. Let's say I'm throwing out arbitrary numbers, but let's say he mows the lawn. You're going to pay him five bucks every time he mows the lawn. He does that for four weeks. He makes $20. The fifth week he's sick or he's tired, or he had a sleepover with his friends or whatever. A lot of parents will say, Hey, you know, you can make it up sometime throughout the week. I'll just go ahead and pay you right now. No wrong answer. You didn't do the work. And so when he's at the, at the toy store and he's like, dad, you know, like, can I, can I have this thing? No, you can't. Do you have the money for it? No. Okay. Then you can't do it. Well, I right. really want it. Okay, then next week when you mow the lawn and you get your new $5, then you can have that thing. But we have to actually stick to our agreement on the easy side of paying and the not so easy side, not paying when they don't do the work. Yeah, that part's hard. It's hard. It is hard. It's super kids. hard. Yep. It's super hard. Um, but I, I think it's it, because it teaches so many different lessons. You know, he, he keeps trying, now that I told him about this like one month that he needs to show his whatever, he keeps coming back and trying to negotiate on that. And now he's at school talking to his friends like, hey, I talked to my dad. I think, you know, I think I'll be able to play with you guys online. And, you know, I'm going to see if I can bump it up to this date. And I could tell he's 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 playing the game, which I could appreciate. Yeah. But it's like, you know, you got to stick, stick to your gun. Yeah. <laughs> Easier said One than done. One thing that you could do maybe as a, maybe as an idea, because you guys have merchandise and everything that you offer. Yeah. Is that done in-house or is that done somewhere else? Oh, no, that's a good idea. Um we could have him like pack and ship, you mean, for for the I, merch? I do that with all of my kids. All of my kids are involved to one degree or another. I used to outsource that to another company. Not only was it expensive and they were making errors, by bringing it in-house, it's literally in my garage. Uh, 
they earn a little bit of, bit of money. I pay them $1 per package processed. But in addition to packaging the orders, there's other things they do. Emails, inventory, different things that they have to do as needed. Uh, buying supplies, that sort of stuff. Um, and that's been a great little money maker. So I'm saving money from a business perspective. I'm getting the write-offs because I'm paying to have that done. And my kids are earning some money and learning more about my business. So if you're looking for creative ideas that that he can be involved with, with your business and have a job, that's been a great first job for my kids. That's a good one for Ava, Gabe. We should look into that for, uh, for Ava. All right, taking a break from the podcast to talk to you about the Train Hard app. If you're listening to this episode, it means you care about training, protecting, and providing, which means that you care about your health, your fitness, and becoming the most capable human being you can, just like me and Jason. Me and Jason use the Train Hard app for our training because there are three programs and it has something regardless of the season in your life you're in. If you have the time and energy and you're trying to be the fittest, strongest human being you can, we have four strength and conditioning five days a week. If life is super busy right now and you need something that's just keeping your momentum from getting to zero, 20, 30 minutes max in the gym, in and out. It has a dumbbell version. If you don't have access to a bunch of equipment, we have the Emon program. And if you're just trying to be the most jacked dad in the room, work on your body composition, we have the Flex program, which is exactly how I train and the program that I write. So if you haven't already, check the link in the podcast show notes, download the Train Hard app, train hard, but let's get back to the show. Can you tell us a little bit more about Order of Man and uh, the Iron Council? I want to kind of dive into... So you came out of the military. Can you kind of go into your background a little bit more of how you came out of the military? You saw a need for, you know, for men and then order of man, your podcast. I mean, it, it goes out to I mean, tons of listeners based on what yeah, I'm seeing. Millions at this point. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. So how's that all evolved? Yeah. So with the military, I, you know, I was in the national guard. So I was doing, I was managing retail clothing stores when my national guard unit got activated in 2005 to go to Iraq and I spent uh, 2005 and some of 2006 in Ramadi, Iraq, which was a, was a crazy time. And during, during our downtime, a lot of guys were watching, you know, full episodes of 24 was the TV series. Everybody was oh, watching then. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And don't get me wrong. I watched those as well, but I spent a lot of time while I was there studying for some insurance and investment exams. And when I came back, I actually ended up getting my insurance and investment licenses then I fast forward about seven, eight years in the financial planning field. And I started doing this podcast called Wealth Anatomy. And it was dedicated to giving medical professionals financial advice and information. And I realized really, really quickly that I love the medium of podcasting, but I wasn't so much interested in that conversation I had had for years up to that point. So I created Order of Man as a side project. I said, I want to do the podcast. I just don't want to talk about that. But what I need in my life is to have conversations with guys like yourselves who are successful in different facets and areas of life. And when we launched the very first episode of Order of Man, it took off. I think the first episode I did of Order of Man had more downloads than the entire previous 20 that I had done for Wealth Anatomy. And I realized very, very quickly that I was onto something. I, I can't say I did this with noble intentions necessarily, it was very selfish. It was self-serving and it wasn't wrong or bad, but I did it for myself. I wanted to have conversations with these guys. And we had a bunch of people start reaching out and they're like, Hey, this podcast is great. And this Facebook group is great. Like what, like we want more, what, what can we do? And I didn't really have anything available, but I had listened to this podcast. I think it was Pat Flynn. I can't remember who it was. And the guest that he on had on had suggested that we start a, a course. So that's what I did. I created a 12 week course. I called it the iron council. I made it available to 12 men and we sold out almost immediately. And I realized, okay, that was when I made my first thousand dollars. I think it was $1, right, $1, right, right, right. Cause right. I offered it for a hundred dollars for three months, which was way underpriced, but I didn't know. And so I made $1,200. I had these guys come in and about eight, nine weeks into the 12 week course there, they were starting to say to me, Hey, what do we do after this? Like we're kind of winding down now, now what? I don't know. <laughs> so I opened up the iron council, made it a little bit more robust, offered some more features and benefits and things like that. And we opened it up and 
man, we're at over a thousand members strong right now. We're uh, lots of features and benefits, team meetings, guys are operating in teams. There's certain channels they can be part of based on the conversations they specifically want to have. Um, I just heard from one of our team leaders, he's got a meetup. His 12 guys are going to be meeting in the next month and getting together face to face and doing their thing. So it's got a little bit of a mind of its own at this point, which I'm really excited to see because so many men are interested in helping us build this and create this incredible resource for men, fathers, husbands, leaders in communities, business owners, whatever a guy would want, you know, he had access to that information and literally a thousand other men who are all working to accomplish the same things. It's, it's been a really, really incredible journey. I feel a little bit like the, uh, the Rogaine, the old Rogaine commercials where the guy's like, I'm not only the president, I'm a client kind of thing. That's me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I started this, but I think I'm I'm the biggest beneficiary of the work that we're doing here. Well, I think that that's, that's always like one of the, the signs of having um, a lot of people that have a successful service product. Like that's what it ends up being, right? It's actually solving like a very, very honest need. One of the things that I also saw on your Instagram was the fact that a lot of the things that you share are you telling yourself what you need to hear. And if that that's benefits it. other people, great. So it's it sounds like the, the Iron Council is very similar. It sounds like it's it's the type of advice, resources, uh, you know, um, community that you would want for yourself. And, you know, if it helps other people and it sounds like the podcast started that way too, right? Like selfishly you wanting to have these conversations with these men and if other people benefit from it, great. And I think the success that you've had is a testament to, you know, this thing that we hear all the time, which is like, if you're trying to solve a very like, you know, honest problem that usually you're facing or you noticed, and this tends to be the case with a lot of people that like invent a product or whatever it's going to do really well. If you try and create something because, oh, this seems like it has, you know, a lot of market potential and it seems like, you know, this is going to, you know, blow up. I think that that's when most of the times it ends up kind of like fizzling or falling flat. Yeah. I mean, I think there are certain people, a great example would be Elon Musk, who's solving some of the world's most complex problems, mm -hmm. right? So you're going to have that. I'm not Elon Musk by any stretch of the imagination. So I think the best thing for a guy like me, ordinary guys like us, is to solve a problem we have and let other people in on the process, you know, and that's, that's worked for me and it's worked for millions of men who have heard our message and, and been involved in our organization in one way or the other. But, um, yeah, so, so solve your own problems and let other people, you know, what's funny is on social media, every once in a while you hear from a guy who's, I'll post something about, you know, being more disciplined, for example, and somebody would be like, well, you know, you need to be more disciplined because of whatever. I'm like, yeah, I know. That's why I wrote that. Like I needed a reminder. It's a personal journal for me. You know, I, I hope I never come as like, I'm talking at people. I can find plenty of accounts that will talk at me. I'm talking to myself, like you said. And if there's a guy who's interested in hearing whatever it is I'm telling myself or whatever lessons I need to learn for the day, then by all means, I go through my own account and I pull up past posts. I'm like, oh, that's a good reminder. Yeah, I need to be better at that. I had one guy not too long ago said, oh man, you're falling short in, in that or whatever. And I said, yeah, if only you knew how short I fall every single day, like it's way worse than you think it is. Trust me. But these are reminders for me to stay on the path that I've chosen to walk. What role does in-person activities play compared to digital? So I'm curious, the Iron Council, is there a vision for the future of taking these do you have these team leaders and then bring them? Well, you mentioned that they're going to do some in person, but like, I'm curious, like, you know, I feel like we've lost a sense of connection in person, which is one of the reasons why we do these men's club meetups every week, because I just think it's a great way to get people together. But obviously you can't always do that. And there's a digital world, like even what we're in right now, we can still connect with guys. Like you could, of course, connect digitally. There's no question that it's way better than not connecting with anybody for sure. What role do you see in the iron council in the future? of doing in-person versus digital. And um, what have you seen kind of like there? I'm curious. Yeah, well, digital is a, is casting a wider net, right? Right. Because of the, of the cost associated with digital versus in-person events, uh, the access to it based on the, the, I should say the geographical constraints that are not there when you're, when you're dealing with something that's digital. 
uh, the, the, the amount of investment you know, that it takes for somebody to sign up for a digital program versus actually come to a live event. It's, it's, it's casting a wider net. And also there's some time constraints, you know, guys are busy. We've got families, we've got lives, we've got a relationship with our wife. We've got uh, other activities and hobbies and things that we're interested in. And so when you're talking about taking out three, four five days to go travel somewhere, I think that's good and valuable but you can't do it every day. Like you might be able to do it with a digital program. Yeah. So that imagine saying, Hey, I'm going to sign up for a gym, but it's going to be a gym in California. When I live in Utah, it's like, <laughs> that's dumb. Like it's not, it's not going to happen. Oh, but Ryan, it's the best gym in the world. Well, I don't care how great it is. If I don't ever get in there, it really doesn't matter. So I need to find something local. And that's the point of digital. It's very convenient. It's very easy. It's very cost effective. And it casts a very wide net. From there, we also ought to be participating in face-to-face, real-life experiences. You've got your men's groups that you do. Uh, we've got an event coming up in May where I'm having 20 guys out here in Southern Utah. I've got a big event. I'm talking about almost 1,000 people we have the capacity for uh, for an event in, in the fall. The more we can get guys face to face sporadically, we can't do this every week, but if you are local with other guys, and that's one of the cool things about our organization with over a thousand guys now, we have men everywhere. So we have regional meetups. If a guy's in Southern California, he can band with the other 50 guys that are in Southern California. If he's in Long Island or somewhere on the East Coast, he can put together a resource or an event to help connect with and meet guys on the East Coast. We're so spread out now at this point that it, it helps facilitate those face-to-face meetups even better than it did before. Mm. I had something I definitely wanted to ask you, um, cause I know we're, we're, we're coming up on time, but I wanted to get your take on, I saw a video that you posted. Um, I'm a big fan of Chris Williamson as well. And, and you were mentioning a podcast that you have heard from him. I don't think it was the one that I had heard, but he kind of touches on this subject a lot. So it could have been another guest. And it was kind of disagreeing with the take that like, we're in a particularly tough time for men. And the reason I I kind of wanted you to expand on that a little bit is I I do think that a reason that this kind of stuff, like what Jason's doing with the meetups and what we're doing at train hard, what you're doing with the iron council council. I think the reason that this stuff is, is taking off is because it's needed because for some reason we're at a point where, you know, if you talk about the struggles of men, it's seen as like diminishing or attacking the struggles of women. Like there's this kind of like zero sum game that we play. That's pretty unfortunate. Um, and just like, you know, if you look at a lot of the data on, you know, suicide rates and addiction and stuff like these things are all moving in the wrong direction, particularly for men. Um, but I thought you had a really interesting take and I'd, I'd like for you to expand on that on disagreeing with this, narrative that like, it's a very tough time for guys specifically right now. Look, we got to be realistic. The statistics you just mentioned are credible statistics. I mean, that's the reality of it. And there's a lot of guys who are struggling, but are they struggling because it's harder, a harder time to be a man, or are they struggling because they're not getting what we historically as human beings have received as men? That's brotherhood, fellowship, accountability, purpose, purpose, all the things that we know we need, right? When we were in tribes 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, 10,000 years ago, the purpose was protect, right? Protect our people. And to your guys' motto, train, right? We're going to train in order to protect our people. Maybe it, maybe the purpose rightfully or, or I should say righteously or unrighteously was to expand our empire. And so there was purpose. There was significance. There was meaning to that. But what meaning do you guys have now? You know, we go into these concrete jungles, we're so sedated, we're inundated with information on a daily basis. None of it really applies or has any sort of relevance in our lives. We go into a job that we're miserable at, we hate, we come home, the relationship is eh, at best, and it's hard for these guys to find any sort of significance and purpose. But just because that's the current reality doesn't mean that it's harder to be a man today than it ever was. If we say that to ourselves, if yeah. that's the narrative, what does our behavior then change into? Well, you know, I, a man can't get ahead. Nothing I can do. Toss up my hands, throw in the towel. Everybody's out to get me. 
The world hates men. That's not my reality. Now there's those people, but the reality that I live in is that I have opportunities for financial prosperity. Unlike any time in human history, I have information and knowledge that's going to keep me healthy, living longer on average than any time in human history. I'm in proximity to people that love me. I have opportunities to create meaning and significance in my life. I have other men who are interested in doing this because they're not getting it, and I can help facilitate it. And also, we have women, children, community members who are starving, starving for male leadership. If I get on social media today, sure, I could find that the overwhelming majority of people potentially are talking about toxic masculinity and how bad men are and why masculinity is inherently a problem or toxic, things like this. But if I look in my own reality, the woman I'm dating values my masculine characteristics. The children, my four children, they value male leadership. The people in my community, whether it's coaching one of my kids' sports teams, I'm coaching my youngest soccer team right now, or being involved in my oldest son's lacrosse team by taking pictures and being involved and helping and giving resources and donating, those people, they are appreciative that I come as a man, that I show up as the man I'm supposed to be. So yeah, broadly speaking, I think you can make the case that there's a lot that we have to fight against, but in our own little worlds, our own universes, our own neighborhoods, I'm telling you, people want you to be a man. And because they want that, it's so much easier to set yourself apart above everybody else. Go Look, take one facet of this. All of us are interested in fitness to one degree or the other. You guys significantly more than I am. If I go to the airport today because I'm flying to wherever, and this is not any sort of judgment about a person's worth as a human being. But if I see 100 people at the airport, 95 of them are fat and obese. So who stands out? Me. Because I'm not. And I carry myself well. And I look fit. And I'm wearing proper clothing. So that's an opportunity for me. Again, I don't, I don't want to get into the like judging people with the worth of their souls. It's not what I'm talking about. But we as men can really set ourselves apart in the barrier, the bar is lower than it's ever been. Guys who are single talking about dating. I mean, talk with some women about their horror stories, about the kind of guys they've been introduced to. All you have to do to find a woman who is lovely and beautiful and you want to spend time with is just be fairly respectful. <laughs> it's kind of pathetic, but it's also kind of nice because it's so easy to be a man because there's so few of us in the world today. Man, I, I love that perspective. That's why I wanted you to dive into it because I hadn't thought of it that way. And I had just read this book of, of, of Boys and Men too that like outlines, it's essentially a whole book of like the statistics of everything that has gone kind of awry for men. But you can look at that one of two ways. You can look at that in, man, it's really tough now throw my hands up and just like, you know, blame the externalities on why I am where I am, or this is a huge opportunity. The bar is low. And like you said, I have access to information. I have access to everything that I would need to emerge far beyond like how low this bar is. Right. Yeah. Um, so no, I, I appreciate you sharing that. That was one of the, the things that I stumbled on um, before this podcast that like really, really got me thinking. So thanks for sharing. Yeah, man. That fires me up. It's like, it's a damn good time. You know, oh, it's dude. a damn, it the is. It's a damn good time. It is. And, it's the best and it, time. And it fires me up because it, it's like, it's such a damn good time to like raise a son. Like that's, that's, that's how I think of it too. Like, man, like, you know, like we can raise some just like badass men for the future. Like with that perspective of like the opportunity that we have now, honestly, how low the bar is and these conversations that we're having and, and the guys that I'm connecting with. So that fires me up too, not just for myself, but you know, for the, the little guy that I'm raising. Well, I mean, when people say that like, oh, it's the worst time or it's hard to be a man. Well, give me another time in throughout human history. You'd like to rewind to <laughs> dude. what yeah. so you want to go to the 1700s. All right, let's go to the 1700s when people lived to 35 years old and there was conflict and wars and battles and uh, scarce resources. Okay, that, that doesn't sound enjoyable to me. 
You want to go back to the days of, you know, the ancient pyramids where there, there were slaves and they were forced to, to move 2000 pound stones across the hot desert and literally die over a, you know, 20 year time frame working on these pyramids for the elite of the elite. Is that what you'd rather live in? Or go back to ancient times when we were in tribes and we had to worry about neighboring tribes coming to kill us and steal our resources and and rape our women and children. Is that was that better to be a man then? No, this is the best time, and we don't do a good a job. I I think as we could in utilizing all that is available to us, dude. Well, that's a great way to kind of come to the conclusion of this podcast. I think that that was, that was powerful, man. I, I agree. I mean, it's like this victim, my, uh, you know, mindset and it, mm -hmm. whatever you have going on in their life, everybody's got shit going on in their life, everybody. But when you talk about it in generalities in terms like, Oh, who is me? Cause I'm a, you know, I'm whatever. This is a great time, man. It's a great time for everybody, right? It's not just for men, for women, for everybody. And, uh, there's so much opportunity if people put themselves in the right mindset for it to come. And, uh, dude, I really appreciate your time on today's show. You know, like, um, you know, obviously your life lessons, your background and what you're doing with the iron council and order of man podcast, dude, I, I think it's great. I've been, you know, obviously a fan from afar for a long time. So just want to say thanks for your time. We really, really appreciate it. Um, I got a lot out of today's show and, and, and Gabe, I'm sure you did as well. Oh, hundred percent, man. I'm, I'm, I'm fired up and, uh, not only about this conversation, but cause I hadn't been super close to a lot of your content and stuff before this but now i am and i'm super glad that i am so um thanks ryan really appreciate you taking the time and gabe becomes hey. a super fan so now he's gonna be all deep he's a deep dive uh, yeah. into everything have to order. Block gabe yeah. before it's I long. Long. I <laughs> creeping me out a little bit <laughs> <laughs> no guys look i appreciate the opportunity i i love this conversation i do quite a few podcasts but there's ones that that really stand out and to be able to have a conversation like this with guys I respect, man, that means the world to me. So thank you for the opportunity as well. For sure. And so th where's the best place um, for people to kind of, you know, go find out more? Obviously, you have your po podcast and the Iron Council, I believe, is is just, well, when this released, I think you just had a cohort begin. But how would that process work and where should people go? And we'll make sure to link it yeah. in the show notes. Yeah. So if you go to orderofman.com or you search Order of Man for podcast. Um, I'm very active on Instagram. That's probably where I'm most active. That's at Ryan Mickler. And my last name is M-I-C-H-L-E-R. If you send me a message and say, hey, you listen to this podcast, I'll get back with you. I'm pretty decent about responding to as many people as I can through DM on Instagram. So make sure to check that out. Do you guys know when this one will go live or do you not have that yet? Uh, yeah, we do actually. Um, and I can tell you in two seconds, it'll be up Monday, April 8th. Oh, April 8th. Yeah. So we will have closed the iron council, but we open up every single quarter. So if you go to orderofman.com slash iron council, and you want to learn a little bit more about what we do, you can watch a video, drop your email in, and then we'll let you know when we open up in the summer. Dude, awesome. I love it, man. Well, Hey, um, appreciate you and I uh, hope everybody has a great day.